Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, um, a pleasure to uh, open up this uh, session and, uh, and can I extend my uh, warm wishes to you all uh, and hope you enjoy your uh, week uh, here in uh, London. It's been uh, great fun, I'd like to say, uh, being part of the organising committee, but I'm just delighted that it's uh, all underway and uh, we're, uh, we're in, in action. So I've been asked to talk about um, who needs frontal sinus surgery, and uh, that's an interesting question to, uh, to pose, really. Uh, I, uh, I asked a few of my colleagues. I asked a few of my colleagues at work. I asked a few of my colleagues here in the, uh, uh, in the conference, uh, who needs frontal sinus surgery? And of course, the answer I got back was, uh, who didn't need frontal sinus surgery? And that's not really much help. Uh, they were sort of scratching their heads and saying, well, I'm not really very sure who needs frontal sinus surgery. So. Um, I, uh, I asked my kids, and of course, uh, they go, went straight to, uh, to Google and said, well, you know, there's lots of people who've got sinusitis, ex-presidents, uh, famous actors, uh, social media stars. Um, but they, yeah, they complain of sinusitis, but they don't necessarily complain of frontal sinusitis. So why is a frontal sinus so important? Well, it's probably because we as clinicians deem it to be particularly important for the reasons uh, shown there. It's a, it's a difficult uh, sinus to, uh, to access compared to the other sinuses. Symptoms may be difficult to characterize. It's challenging to manage, particularly when there's difficult pathology. Uh, and uh, I think we all have the fear of complications, not just the early complications, but the more of this you do and the longer you do it, it's the long-term complications that we all uh, really uh, worry about to a, a greater extent. So I'm going to talk a little bit about getting the diagnosis right, because I actually think that's the most important thing. Talk a little bit about the inflammatory uh, conditions and maybe a little bit of a potpourri of other things that, uh, that uh, are involved. It's my sinuses doc. That's, it. That's, that's what it tends to be, isn't it? They come into the uh, consulting room, your patients, and say, it's my sinuses. And not invariably, uh, you have somebody like this, you'll probably recognize Pavel. Uh, Pavel's got, uh, he's got a headache, and uh, he, uh, he, uh, he comes up to you with uh, sinusitis, and he tells you it's sinusitis because he's had a chat with his family, his, uh, his neighbours, he's talked about it over the fence. He's uh, gone on to social networks himself, and uh, he's diagnosed himself with sinusitis, and he's even got the pharmacist, and the pharmacist has started giving him pills for his, uh, his sinusitis. But in fact, it's up to us as clinicians to really delve into that diagnosis that the patient comes with uh, and look at those symptoms in a bit more <coughs> detail. Because undoubtedly, facial pain and headache are associated with frontal sinusitis. Um, but the issue, of course, is that the other symptoms are equally, if not more, important. And those are ones that we really need to um, drill down on. But the neurological facial uh, pains are also associated with these sort of symptoms. So it's not unusual for migraineous patients to complain of rhinorrhea and nasal obstruction usually as part of the, uh, the headache. So it tends to come on around about the same time of the headache. And you're sort of sitting out there thinking, well, I know I can diagnose migraine, you know, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, phonophobia. But actually, a lot of daily migraine is chronic migraine is not necessarily associated with these other symptoms. And unless you take a really clear history, you can find yourself going down the wrong um, path. And that's, that can be potentially catastrophic. So we've got to corroborate, of course, with uh, endoscopy and possibly imaging, because every now and then, those of us that uh, practice frontal sinus surgery uh, will come across a patient like this. Repeated upper respiratory infections, got a bit of asthma, uh, a bit of um, uh, allergy, and presents with, uh, with headache. Uh, clinician didn't perform a nasal endoscopy uh, and proceeded to uh, surgery. And this patient's had lots of frontal sinus surgery. Uh, and now has uh, a, a neogenesis of the frontal sinus outflow tract. His CT, his pre-op CT, his initial presenting CT, uh, didn't look anything like this. He had a London Mackay score of less than 10 with barely any uh, pacification of his uh, frontal sinuses, but he is now a frontal sinus cripple, uh, having had that in, uh, induced iatrogenically. So we've got to be careful in, uh, in this area. So we, could, we need to go back to basics, as I said. We need to think about the history. We need to think about the uh, response to uh, respiratory infections. We need to, to, to think about the, the treatment, the, the benefit that patients get from treatment. It may not be entirely successful medical treatment, but they do tend to get some benefit. And of course, the nasal endoscopy giving us some objective evidence and the, uh, the CT imaging 
which in fact, here we've got a, a, a set of CT images which look classically like frontal sinusitis. We've got ethmoiditis, we've got some changes within the, um, the, uh, the, the, the bone there. It all really adds up to uh, frontal sinusitis. So it may not necessarily be as easy as that every time, uh, but we do have to really think about what we're, we're, we're doing. So we've got a diagnosis. How are we going to manage these patients? Well, it's a real challenge, uh, management, and, and uh, in terms of the frontal sinus, because we don't have uh, fantastic evidence uh, uh, for the frontal sinus uh, alone. In fact, in chronic rhinosinusitis, we still don't have uh, a defined uh, uh, treatment out, uh, outcomes. Um, and in terms of, of, of why that is, we, we really haven't clarified, as you heard earlier, uh, in Vitzka's talk, uh, all the underlying uh, etiologies that uh, contribute to, uh, to this. And what constitutes an endpoint um, to treatment? Well, we don't have that yet for uh, generalised uh, chronic rhinosinusitis, so we don't really have it for frontal sinusitis, and we don't have a patient-reported outcome measure uh, for frontal sinusitis. And the mantra, maximum medical therapy, well, is maximum medical therapy appropriate in all cases? And of course, I think the there is a move to consider that, that isn't the case, and if you look at some of the recent literature in uh, 2018, Richard Harvey's work looking at um, drill-out procedures for polyposis and frontal sinusitis, well, it does tend to make sense, doesn't it? If you remove the disease load from the uh, frontal sinus, then allowing medical therapy to get in there uh, is likely to, um, to, to be beneficial, although perhaps we don't understand fully uh, the changes in the um, physiology of that sinus once we, uh, we open it up. So we've got a, a difference uh, culturally and geographically in the extent of uh, frontal sinus surgery that we see um, performed. Um, it's interesting uh, looking at why that might be. It's not just patient disease related, it may be other patient factors as well. The study from the States looking at uh, uh, those patients who tend to, to, to receive more frontal sinus surgery. We know that males tend to get more so than females and different ethnic groups get it more uh, than, than others. And we also know that surgeons who do more sinus surgery tend to do more uh, frontal sinus surgery. But uh, work from our own group uh, in, in Newcastle identifies that it doesn't really matter which procedure that you potentially uh, undertake for chronic rhinosinusitis, the outcomes tend to be positive. If you look at patient-reported outcomes, and that's all the way through from ballooning all, all the way up to uh, uh, drill-out procedures. And that's across all four domains of the uh, SNOT22 um, score. But if we do look at those more extensive procedures, despite the fact that the draft 3 has been around a long time, we still see, even in large studies like this one from Belgium, that the long-term outcomes uh, are still not as satisfactory as we'd hoped they would be with restenosis rates of uh, up to 15% and revision rates of uh, uh, at least 10%. And looking at the economic modeling of uh, frontal sinus surgery. Um, it doesn't appear to be uh, uh, evidence based on this study in, in the laryngoscope last year uh, looking at uh, economic modelling uh, with um, uh, decision tree economic analysis uh, which doesn't necessarily show that frontal sinus surgery alone has any particular benefit over uh, standard endoscopic procedures. So we still have a lot of unknowns in terms of, uh, of treatment. So if we move away from chronic uh, sinusitis to the acute stage. Uh, and if we're looking at the evidence here, then really we're looking at small retrospective studies, largely in, in adolescence and, uh, and, and childhood. Uh, and here we've got a patient who not uh, untypically presents with a complicated frontal sinusitis. He's got a swelling over his forehead. He's got a little bit of uh, orbital swelling as well. Uh, and uh, he's got the sort of classic complicated frontal sinusitis. And the, the issue here, of course, is the concern about intracranial complications. And certainly in the UK, we would proceed to CT imaging and, and probably MR imaging in this case, uh, given that MR is a better detector of uh, small intracranial abscesses. Uh, and as such, um, I appreciate that may not necessarily be available in all parts of the, uh, the world, but really, uh, we need to have the, the information uh, to be able to best manage these patients. And clearly, if there's any deterioration, then we need to be thinking about uh, involving our neurosurgical colleagues. And, uh, and that particularly the case, the ones that we really tend to, to, to worry about are the, the adolescent males. They seem to be more at risk of intracranial complications in the, uh, in the, in the published series and, and from our own data as well. Uh, seem to be more at risk with uh, strep miller eye infections, which 
predispose them uh, to more uh, virulent uh, 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 infections. But when to intervene from an, uh, an, a neurosurgical perspective, and certainly there seems to be a move now to, uh, to manage smaller uh, abscesses, intracranial abscesses, uh, medically, uh, our neurosurgical colleagues are publishing small extradurals, small intracerebral abscesses, which are managed with intravenous antibiotics, provided there's no evidence of cerebral edema or brain shift, and provided there's no evidence of uh, neurological deterioration. But the difficult ones for us are not necessarily the brain abscesses, are the ones who've just got frontal sinusitis and when to intervene, because as we heard earlier, these, these, these patients often tend to present with little in the way of preceding uh, symptoms, um, and they often present late in the evening, and do we start medical treatment or we, do we intervene uh, surgically? And I think it's certainly in the UK we would tend to favour uh, 24 hours at least of antibiotics, and, and if there was any deterioration thereafter, think about uh, a, a, a surgical approach. And in terms of what type of surgery that would be, it doesn't really seem to matter whether it's an external or whether it's a a, 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 an endonasal procedure, uh, the outcomes seem to be uh, uh, equally, uh, equally good for managing an acute uh, uh, situation. So I've talked a little bit about the infective uh, etiologies. We've, of course, got other uh, indications. So here we've got a fellow with a mucosal, uh, a uh, displaced orbit. Uh, so a smaller mucosal that presents uh, within the frontal sinus, perhaps incidentally, may not necessarily need surgery, Maybe something we can manage serially uh, by, uh, with serial imaging. Uh, but in this sort of instance where we've got uh, clearly early complications, uh, then surgery uh, is necessary and, and can be, uh, uh, be challenging, uh, particularly when you've got a lot of new bone formation and a, and a laterally placed mucosal. <coughs> and of course, for cosmetic reasons as well, here we've got a fellow who's got a, a displaced anterior table uh, and immediately placed... Uh, uh, mucosal managed uh, uh, nicely from a, a surgical perspective and, and shouldn't be left uh, without intervening. Osteomas, uh, perhaps the, the, the second or the uh, uh, commonest pathology we see uh, from a, a neoplasia perspective within the frontal sinus. The smaller ones, of course, we know don't necessarily grow, so again can be managed uh, from a, an expectant uh, point of view, but the larger ones like this one on the right, uh, where there's orbital involvement, uh, again, needs to be managed from a, a, a surgical perspective. And the last group really to, to, um, to talk about are really the, the inverting uh, papillomas. So here we have a patient uh, on CT imaging who has a mass in the uh, uh, middle meatus extending into the frontal sinus uh, and clearly needs MR imaging to uh, elucidate what indeed is tumour and what is uh, retained um, secretions. But inverting papilloma within the frontal sinus needs to be managed very carefully because, in general, once inverting papilloma presents out with the middle meatus, uh, your risk of dysplasia or squamous cell carcinoma seems to be greater. So it's really important to ensure that uh, all that disease is removed um, when uh, considering surgical resection. And perhaps we'll hear later in the, uh, uh, the symposium uh, what would be the appropriate management for this sort of uh, uh, case. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I really wanted to talk about today was to make to set the scene for our, uh, uh, our, our uh, session, uh, to ensure that we think about a correct diagnosis. Uh, we still have a lack of evidence or, or weak evidence to tell us when the timing of surgery is clear in the inflammatory conditions. I think we have a, a better idea uh, in those conditions which are uh, non-inflammatory. So I do hope you enjoy the rest of your uh, conference and I look forward to uh, chatting with you later. Thanks very much.